Very good morning, everyone. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I heard that there are five or six nationalities in this room, right? There's people from Japan. Anyone from Japan? Ohayo gozaimas. I live in Japan, 1992. Matsuyama, Shikoku Island. Yeah, I also learned that someone from Thailand. Sorry, Krab. Sabaydi, Krab. Sabaydi. I live in Thailand, 19, uh, 2006 until 2010. Five years in Thailand with five different prime ministers. From Taksin until the last one is Abisit. I heard also people from Holland, Netherlands. Goedemorgen. I live in Netherlands. 2012 until 2015, three and a half years. And for those who are not know, you see Dutch people, normally they are tall. Right? And we, this morning we are talking about C. And for those who are not aware, 60% of Netherlands, even more, are below sea level. That's why they need to be tall. <laughs> oh no, because they eat brocha and cas every day. A bread and cheese every day. I also learned someone from China. China, uh, Ni hao ma? Ja sang hao? Ni che la ma? Che? I live in China. <laughs> in Guangzhou. 2015 until 2016. Before I returned in 2016 to Danone. So I returned back to Indonesia after working 11 years outside Indonesia. Uh, including also in Japan and Middle East in Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, there is no one from Arabic, uh, that area. Um, happy to share with you. Before I switch to the subject, Mbak Rashika, anytime, uh, please ask any question during the session. So we don't have to wait until the end because probably there's, uh, uh, my slide will be very, very plain. Very plain. But I will give you a video to watch and, and enjoy, right? So, uh, however, The slide is very plain, this part of the slide is very plain. The content, I believe, should be deep enough for us to debate and discuss. So interrupt me anytime, ask any question, and challenge whenever you feel appropriate. Would it be okay? Right? Uh, before I move to the subject, uh, I need to promote my company, because you are going to see the company tomorrow, right? Uh, but this is it, this is the only slide. Danone, as you probably know, is a publicly listed company, so everyone can own Danone. So I cannot say Danone is owned by who, but it's a, it's a public company. Um, in Indonesia, we have three divisions of Danone, which is water division, aqua, you see the brand, and early life nutrition, which is baby food, that you will see the factories tomorrow. And that is the biggest factories within Danone Global. So you have seen, the, you will see the, the, the biggest factories of early life nutrition in, in Danone worldwide. Uh, early life nutrition, some of the brands, probably I couldn't mention the brand here uh, because nobody has a small kids, right? Not yet. Because that brand is for small kids, so it doesn't matter for you, you will not uh, recognize anyway. Uh, but both brands, uh, both uh, water division and early life nutrition, we are the market leaders, more than 50% market share in Indonesia. A total companies turn around turnaround in this this country is about 1.5 billion euro. So I'm not sure about in rupiah, too many zeros probably, right? 1.5 billion euro. And we employed 1,400, sorry, 14,000 employees in the country, in Indonesia. So myself, responsible for operation, which is the biggest part of early life nutrition, representing the, the CEO, Gustavo Hildenbrand, who is currently in Portugal. So, But nonetheless, hopefully you don't miss anything. So that's about the company, right? This morning, I had a pleasure to also join the session from Pak Made, uh, where while we're talking about this morning about social, economics, and political landscape of international borders or sea levels, what do you call it? Of demographic or geographic of, uh, of the, the, the region. My session, we are going to bring that one into corporate life, into corporation context, in the context of companies. How does it play in the company? And hopefully, even though we use the context of a corporation, we are going to be able to pull some of the learnings in other contexts 
like education, edu uh, education uh, institution, non-profit organization, and so forth. Right? So let me start with asking you a question. Instead, you ask me a question. What is the goal? What's the word? What's, what's the word? It's a singular, not a plural. What is the goal? Not the goals. So you have to have only one answer. What is the goal of a corporate or business entity? Profit? You're from finance? That's why your answer is profit. For accounting, profit doesn't mean with cash. It's, it's not really means cash. Right? Sometimes you make a profit, but you're broke. Really, right? Uh, for those who are accounting, can explain to you, even though you make a profit, you broke. You think you make a profit. Anyone? Fulfill people's needs. Who is the people? Why? If you lose money and your customer happy, but you lose money, will you survive? Your customer very happy, but you lose money. Can you survive? Okay. To sustain the business, what does it mean to sustain the business? Keep it alive, even though it's maybe growing, right? Maybe. Anyone have a better answer? Yes, Pa? What does it mean, maximizing company's values? What is the values of the company? How you measure it? Market share? Uh, could you please make it louder so the class can hear for you? Is it possible that a company has a very famous brand, well-known, respected, and customer happy, but they don't make money and lose and close down the business? Blackberry, for example. It's a big brand, right? So, yes, sir. Huh? Prosperity in, in what term? In accounting terms, or yeah, we are in the faculty of economics, right, mostly? Right? Exactly, make more money. Make money, even more money. Then I will explain to you what you just discussed. I will explain to you later on. So the goal is to make money, even more money, right? Have you heard about the concept of hedgehog concept? Hedgehog. Hedgehog is the animal, right? But there's a hedgehog concept. Again, you can Google it, right? So hedgehog concept is only three circles. Unfortunately, there's no flip chart here, but you can visualize it. Three circles. And the best sweet spot for a company to operate is in the middle. The first circle, the company has, a, has to operate producing service or goods where the consumers want it. So the first circle, consumer want. Circle number two is what the company is capable of doing. You can do it. Circle number three, where you can make most money. You miss one of the circle, your company will not survive. Yes, you can do it. That's what the, what the customer wants, but you don't make money for that. Or you can make more money over there. You can do it, but nobody wants it. Or consumer wants it. You can make profit of that, but you don't know how to do it. Right? So, back to your point, people on the back before. A CEO, a CEO, will have one single metric. Have you heard about the concept of KPI, Key Performance Indicator, right? If you are doing your job, we you get your first job, normally you, your boss will give you performance metric, targets, right? And measured by Key Performance Indicator, KPIs. When you achieve your KPIs, you get promotion or you get a, a good bonus. A KPI for a CEO is this one. And this is a Bible of a CEO. What a CEO, any CEO will have to do, will have to deliver, is what? Can you guess? A CEO of a company. Thinking yourself five years from, from now, you become a CEO of your own company. What is the single matrix that is the most important matrix for a head of a company, the CEO? Exactly to your point before. They call it, this is from Harvard Business uh, School, total shareholder returns. Maximizing total shareholder returns. Making sure that the investor 
right? When they invest in the company, they can get the maximum return. How you measure the return of investor? When you have a money, ten dollars. I know you have a more than ten dollars, right? Just assuming ten dollars, and you want to invest. You want to invest. There is a lot of choices to invest, right? You can invest in the property. You can invest to anything else, to gold, to future tradings. You can invest in stock markets, shares, and you can choose the shares. And you want to have a highest return, of course, at the risk level that you want it to be, right? That you can accept. The return of shareholders measured by two. The growth. Sorry, I cannot point this one. The stock price growth, the changes in the stock price, and the dividend yield. I hope I'm not confusing with the terms, right? You're from economics, right? So you should familiar. Raise your hand if you're not familiar, because I designed this slide to speak with the economics student. For engineering, it's a very different slide, right? So stock price difference and dividend yield, and you go down below. That's how you build your company performance. At the end of the day, what you want to achieve is the highest total shareholder returns. Are you with me so far? So we start with the goal of the corporation, and then the way how we want to bring from here to that point. That's the journey of the next. 90 minutes or today. So far, so good. Yes. You're not familiar. Dividend yield is that when you invest, if you are shareholders, sometimes you get money dividend. When when the company make a profit and cash, sometimes they decide it to share the profit to the investors. That's we call it dividend. Bagi hasil. Are you Indonesian? They call it bagi hasil, right? In Indonesia. Any other question? Are we get on? Are we good on this one? So you go below. Mostly, when you get your first job, either as a marketing, as a sales, as a finance, as whatever, you get the KPI at the lower level. Let's grow sales. Let's gain market share and so forth. That is your KPI. The CEO KPI is on the top, right? All right. Now we said before we want to build competitive advantage, which is getting the highest shareholder returns through operation management. My second question: What is operation management? Yeah, activities, day-to-day -day activities such as. Production, planning, distribution, procurement. Very good. Any other ones to have a different answer? What is the operation management? It's managed to operate, right? If not, let me just show you a video instead of explaining what is operation management. Is it okay? So many people said before I go with the video. Many people said that the frontliner of a company is marketing. Without marketing, companies is dead. Of course, the marketers will say say so, right? Finance people will say that the best company, if you can manage financial best, self, you make a judgment. Since we are a background before the video, since we are the month of July, I think everybody knows about Fourth of July, right? What is that Fourth of July? The independence of the United States of America, nineteen seventeen seventy six. Right, Fourth of July. Do you have a Fourth of July in uh, France? Fourteenth of July is Independence, but you also have a Fourth of July, Fifth of July, Sixth of July, Seventh of July. Of course, right. <laughs> also, there is a Fourth of July in Thailand, right? Ah, uh, so the history. Anyone understand about the history of the United States? You you studied there, right? You should learn to study the history of the United States. So the independence of the United States started about even before two years before the independence. So they start a war, American Revolution, they call it. That's a three years war. During that time, America, North America in particular, are under colony of many countries. They are under colonies like Indonesia under colonies, right? There are three countries who colonized uh, North America. British, French, 
and Spain. And they have their own territory. The biggest territory owned by the British in the US. Dutch, for example, Holland also have a territories. Do you know New York? It used to be owned by Holland, by Dutch. But they make a trade. They call it, there's a new Amsterdam in Holland, right? In the US, there is a, there is a city called Holland in Michigan State. In Michigan, there is a Holland. They call it uh, Holland. So there are three countries that colonize uh, North America, British, France, and Spain. Sometimes they fight to each other, sometimes they don't. Two years be before independence, uh, George Washington, who is, the, who is the first president of the United States, proclaimed the independence of United States. It started at, in Washington when they have a demonstration. It started, with, it started with a demonstration challenging the British when they raised the tax for tea, drinking tea. So the British increased the tax and there's a protest. And that protest, they call it Tea Party. That protest started the American Revolution. So they fought for three years. And the British at that time is the strongest army in the planet. The strongest army in the planet on land and on water. No one can ever defeat the British. Even the Americans, the local Americans. So George Washington lose the battle in every front. In every front. So in one year after this, 1997, the British decided once to crush you know, the rebellion led by George Washington once and for all. Kill them all. Finish all these kind of noises. Right? They want to continue their coloni colonization. There are two generals leading its camp. On the left, Horato Gates is the American general under George Washington. And they are very poor, untrained, not enough equipment, and they lost almost in every battle. On the right one is General John Burgoyne. He's a British general based in Canada, British Columbia in Canada. They went down to crush this army once and for all. This is 1977. So far, are you good with the background of history? Let's see the video, the first one. The Battle of Saratoga. This is the moment of truth of the independence of the U.S. Can you help play? By June, a new British army of 8,000 men heads south from Loyalist Canada. Its objective, kill off the American Revolution once and for all. They're led by General John Burgoyne, an aristocrat, politician, and art lover. He's also one of the best cavalry officers in the British military. Burgoyne pushes south, following the Hudson River. His army is like a mobile city. The redcoats are accompanied by 2,000 servants, wives and mistresses. Two hundred supply wagons carry 84 tons of powder and shot, as well as silver and porcelain tableware for the officers' meals. Burgoyne's plan is simple. All right, Burgoyne led a big army equipped with a lot of logistic supplies, right? You, you heard yourself, uh, 2,000 servants. Just imagine the numbers of army, including porcelains, tableware, everything for the officers uh, dining. This is like going to a party, right? Because they said that American army is very weak, you just crush them, right? So that's a Burgoyne. Um, thinking about operation management, they are managing the troops, right? That they think they will win, easy. And they rely with that kind of operation approach, strategy. And then see... One week after that battles, the first there are two battles in Saratoga. The second battles is the turning point, the game changing, right? At that time, the France and Spain didn't take a side. There's only be between the Americans and the British. They're just watching the France and Spain. Also, the two strongest army at the time, right? 
the second movie, which is the game changer. It's late summer in 1777. The American Revolution is in its third year, and it's not going well for the Americans. Their British rivals control Newport, Rhode Island, much of Canada, and parts of New York. Their navy can attack almost any spot along the eastern seaboard at will. Now the British want to take over New England by controlling ports along the Hudson River, most importantly, Albany. But a colonial force gets in their way in two game-changing encounters at Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga is actually two battles fought 18 days apart. The first battleground on the outskirts of Saratoga takes place at Freeman's Farm on September 19, 1777. The British under John Burgoyne were surrounded by Americans. They were trapped and their only hope was to wait for British reinforcement. More than two weeks pass. September turns into October and Burgoyne's reinforcements never arrive. On October 7, 1777, Burgoyne launches a second attack on the Americans, this time in Bemis Heights. But by that time, it was too late. The Americans had too many troops in the area, and Burgoyne realized he had to surrender. On October 17, 1777, Burgoyne and nearly 6,000 soldiers surrender. America's victory at Saratoga was a big deal. The Americans had defeated a large chunk of an amazing army. So the surrender was really meaningful to both the Americans and the British. And a British officer at the time talked about how the American soldiers all were absolutely silent because they couldn't quite believe what they were watching as each British soldier individually came up and handed over his arms. At the end of the day, the British lost, the Americans won, and because the Americans had this amazing victory over the British army, the French now felt comfortable coming in and helping the American cause. And without French assistance, the Americans probably could never have won the American Revolution. With the victory at Saratoga, France joins the war, backing the colonists. The tide of the war now turns in favor of the Americans. So that's why the independence of Americans now begin in place. Any lesson learned from the story? Lesson learned from the st story. Yes. I expect and expect it, right? Never underestimate. Could be, yes. Any other lesson learned? So this is what many literature said. This is also a quote from Nap Napoleon Bonaparte, one of the greatest general in, in, in the France, uh, from France, that the British failure in the American Revolution is because of failure in operation management. Sounds cool, right? It's not me saying, you see the quote over there. Because the British Army rely on logistic operation from 10,000 miles away. They rely on supplying, getting the supplies from that. Remember the first mission of uh, uh, General John Burgoyne? is carry their own logistic, carry their own supplies. And then after they see that the fight is longer than they thought, they're expecting a new supplies will come, but never came. So they lost the second battle, right? Where are American troops, they're locals. They get food, they get supplies, everything from their own region. So the failure of British army is because they underestimate the enemy, they thought that within a few days they will crush them. In fact, it's longer than a few days, so they run off the, the supply. They run off the logistics and they're relying their supplies from very far of the location. The British army at that time only capable to build their operation to support the army eight years later or four years later, but it was too late. The friends already joined and helping the American and the enemy become too strong even for the British. Napoleon once quoted that armies, a strong army, even a strongest army, marches on their stomach. If you cannot feed them, they lose and they die. This is the same uh, example of uh, Second World War, of uh, First World War, Russian and German. Why Russian won at the time? And German was the strongest army at the time, right? So, 
This is about operation management. I try to explain operation management in history. Hope you, you get the learning, right? So sometimes, uh, have you read the business case of Walmart? Written by uh, another Harvard Business Review. If you read the Harvard Walmart. Walmart used to be the strongest company during that time. And uh, Wall family is the richest family at the time. And the strongest, the strength, the competitive advantage is coming from operation management, not from marketing, not from finance, right? Right, now, let's connect the two. At the first side, we said the total shareholder returns, that's a company objective, through operation management, right? How those two connected? And this is the slide, how to connect, right? On the left-hand side, you see a simplified PNL or cash flow, right? For those in accounting, correct me if I made some mistake here, right? Uh, it's very simple, right? It's a sales, cost of good, gross margin, operating expense, taxes, net earning, depreciation, amortization, EBITDA, and so forth, until you get the net financing acti activities there. That's the way how you report your financial, right? So the question is that, where do you think operation management, when you had an idea already, what does it mean, operation management, can influence which line on your PNL that operation can influence? And give an example. Sales, why? I heard about sales. You have to supply to make, to, to make a sales, right? So supply coming from operation management. Good, sales. Secondly, so you can influence sales, the top line. Can you influence cost of good? Definitely. Definitely. My PNL is bigger than the CEO PNL in Danone. Because cost of good of our product is bigger. So my response, I have my own finance director, by the way. Uh, so cost of good is very important. Gross margin is a function, sales minus gross. Interest expenses. Can operation management influence interest expenses? This is money you pay to the bank or institution that you borrow money, right? The interest you pay. Can operation management influence that one? You want to make it lower as possible, right? Have any idea? Inventory, working capital. Can you reduce your working capital? Inventory is one of the working capital. Payables, can you pay longer to your supplier? Receivable, can you collect money faster? from your customer. So your working capital is lower, so you don't have to borrow money. If you have to borrow money, it will be small and you pay less interest. Taxes. Can operation management influence tax? How much money, how much tax you have to pay? Really? I will show you later on the last slide. It will, it can. Surprisingly, right? Surprisingly, right? Hold your curiosity. Depreciation, amortization, of course how much asset that you have to make the same product, right? Account receivable, we, talk, we talked before, inventory payables, working capital chains, and so forth. The only line that you cannot influence, which one? From operation management. Which line do you think in this PNL that operation management cannot influence? I think dividends. Dividence is decision of the board. Even though you have a cash or money, sometimes you decided not to give back to the shareholders as a dividend, right? Maybe you keep it or reinvest it, right? That is not the, the uh, influence under operation management. Disagree, agree? If you disagree, help me. So I need also learn from you. Right, I take it as agreement, right? Now, how operation, how you get advantage in operation management? Only three simple things. And each of the things is only one slide, maximum two, right? So bear with me and then try to challenge or ask question if you don't understand. When we said get fundamental rights, for those who eventually will work in operation, right? Running of factories, making production planning, supply planning, procurement, that's kind of operation activities, quality, Sometimes you talk about, your KPI is about many things. My only advice to my team is that every KPI that you have, whenever you start your job, right, when, when your boss gives you a KPI, try to understand how your KPIs 
move the needle? How your KPIs change the PNL? Sometimes you get a KPI like customer complaint if you are in the customer service group, right? And you want to reduce customer complaint. How does it change PNL? That is very important to so understand the goal, right? You understand the objective, not just single metrics. The gap fundamentals, right, is only one slide, what I call it money machine. How can you use everything under your sphere of control to move the needles of the PNL? You want to move the profit up, you want to make return on investment higher, and you want to make your cash flow better. Understand about cash flow, right? I'll give an example. You know, understand different cash flow and profit? Let me give an example. Sorry, uh, what's your name? Kun Lek and Kun Ploy. Kun Ploy, uh, both Thailand. Kun Lek and Kun Ploy. Let me see I'm a middleman. Kun Lek sold this kind of thing, $1 to me per piece, $1. And she wants to have cash on delivery. Kun Ploy willing to buy this one from me, $5 per piece and she wanting to pay 30 days after delivery right is it a good business or not I can buy one dollar and sell it five dollars right it's a good business right I make a profit of what four that's profit right let's make a simulation couldn't like I buy one and this is cash your one dollar sell it five dollars employ and she said that five uh, 30 days from now i will pay should i be happy it's four dollars right i just wait for 30 days i get 400 percent profit or 500 percent profit margin and then could employ happy with my with this product and she, she told me risky i want to buy it tomorrow i would like to buy another 10. i said good so good like i need another 10. oh sure risky no problem this is your 10 and give me your ten dollars. I get ten. Give him, a, give her ten dollars. Sell it to Kunploy. Ten dollars and thirty days payment. Ten of five dollars, fifty dollars. So how much margin do I have? Fifty dollars. Uh, sorry, forty dollars plus the first one four dollars, right? But I already get out my money eleven dollars. And Kunploy even more happier. And she said, risky. I need another 100 unit. I'm happy. And I asked Kunlek, Kunlek, do you have 100, another 100 pieces? He said that, yes, Ricky, this is 100. But I didn't have money, more money. And I asked my mother-in-law, father-in-law, can I borrow money, right? This is a good business. And continue like that. And at the end, I'm broke. My mother-in-law was very hungry, angry. Where's my money, right? And I, can, I cannot borrow to my second mother-in-law because I don't have a second mother-in-law, only one mother-in-law. So that is a cash flow and profit. So you have to improve both profit and cash flow, not only profit and cash flow. And how you improve it, there is a point at the bottom here. I don't want to go details, but you always talk about throughput. Throughput is the way how you, the rate you generate system. For example, let's say we open uh, a donut, donut factories and you bought an oven. Right, an oven to make a donut or burger, right? And then this oven, the machine supplier said it can make 10 donuts per hour. Right? You want to maximize it, right? One hour, you want to make it 10 donuts, even, even more if you can improve the way how you make a donut, more than 10. If you produce less than 10 an hour, you have a less throughput. If you can produce higher, you have a higher throughput. So you want to make it higher because you already paid the oven. You want to make it even more powerful, more faster, right? The second one is inventory. You need something. You make a donut, you need the, the dough, you know, the, the mix, right? And you want to make it as low as possible because inventory is money, it's cost that you put in. You make it faster and then more customers to buy. And last one is operational expense, electricity, you know, everything, right? The salary of your workers in the donut, uh, stores and so forth and you want to make it reduce and how to influence how to impact each of profit return on investment and cash flow at the top are we good so 
most likely, if you start working your first job, you will get the KPI below this one, below throughput, before, below inventory, before operating expenses. Now, this is more funnier, more, a lot of philosophical, but it's applicable to any field that you're going to enter, any field you're going to enter. I would call it cross over the frontier line because it's very common, very common, that when you start your job, you're making a trade-off, you're making a choices. A or B, you cannot do both. For example, if you are doing a marketing job, right? If you're doing marketing job and your boss asks you to increase market share, what is your first response? When your boss asks you, increase market share by 10 points, what is normally your response going to be? Give me more, more budget, right? I need more marketing budget. So I can advertise more, I can make more promotion. There is a trade-off. You want to increase market share, but you increase cost. So this is what I mean the frontier line. I'll give an example of, you can, you can make any, any axis there. But on the vertical, horizontal axis, there is a service level. How much you want to serve your customer? Let's say 100%, right? And then the upper one is the cost or revenue that you can get from improving service level. Normally, I'll give an example of restaurant later on. Normally, this is a curve of service level. When you want to improve your service to your customers, at the very beginning at the left, it's so cheap. But the more you want to increase your service to customers, it's become more expensive and more expensive. It's exponential. I'll give an example. Let's say you open a restaurant in Jogja, right? And you expect people to come to your place. My, my, by the way, my retirement plan is to have a Thai restaurant. Small, because I love Thai food. Uh, but anyway, you, you have a plan, uh, you, you're opening a restaurant. Let's in Borobudur, right? And the restaurant is getting busier and busier. The business is getting better and better. And you need more waiters, you need more help. So you hired helpers very basic helpers, right? To clean up the table, do the dishes at the kitchen, help you with whatever, taking out orders and whatever. The cost is quite not expensive. But then you have more foreigners. You have people from Japan coming, people from France. Then you want a waiter who can speak Japanese. Nihongo wakarimasta, wakarimasen. Is that right? Okay. A little I can speak. So that's more expensive, right? You need to have waiters that can speak Japanese. It's more expensive than you know, regular waiters. But then you are willing to invest waiters who can speak Japanese or French or any other language because you expect higher return, correct? You expect that more revenue, the more Japanese, they're very rich, right, by the way, to come to your store, to your restaurant. So you expect higher revenue for sure but the revenue unfortunately curve is not exponential as well they call it in logistic and statistic they call it bus model at one level it's just flattening i give an example in asia let's say in asia what is the the most famous in terms of service airlines in asia hmm? Singapore Airlines, let's pick any, any airlines, right? Singapore Airlines, although I slightly disagree with that. Very nationalist, I love Garuda. But anyway, let's take your example. Singapore Airlines, the best service airlines for the in service in the, in the region, right? You know the different, let's say the sitting in the economic class, right? If you travel in Singapore Airlines, economic class, and Garuda in economic class, they serve you with food, Jakarta, Singapore, right? In Garuda, the spoon, plastic. In Singapore Airlines, the spoon and fork, utensils, stainless steel, right? That's a service. They want to improve service. And it's not cheap. But have you heard Singapore Airlines waiter say that, welcome on board, ladies and gentlemen, to Singapore Airlines flight SQ, whatever, and enjoy your meal, and you can bring back your spoon as your souvenirs. No, because they know it's going to increase their cost, but not people flying Singapore Airlines not because they can bring back the spoon. No, right? So there's a limit of doing more, even more service. Unilever yesterday spoke, I'm not sure whether they speak or not, but Unilever has a project before 
they call it project zoo z o o zero out of stock unilever is very wide product right from toothpaste to anything they said they even claim 95% of household in indonesia will carry at least one brand of unilever in their home right and they want to attack out of stock situation you know out of stock yeah, that you want to buy something but you cannot find it in the shelf and they stop the project they want to improve service up to 100% they stop it why they're happy with whatever 95% 96% service level not 100% because it's became too expensive because the profit in return or the revenue in return is not as high as the cost incremental so what the company is looking for is the difference between the blue line and the red line correct they want to see the different the quest of maximizing profit and if you make a curve in the other way around this is it this is a stop so every company is trying to find a sweet spot where they want to improve the surface level when they can really get the maximum returns they're not going to go with 100% surface level right this is a very theoretical now the question for us is that many company if you're operating at the upper left of the red curve you're dead because your cost is higher than what you should be right so many company wants to be in the frontier line in the red line are you with me right because imagine if your company your profile your operation management or your company uh, operation is somewhere in the middle on the left your surface level is on the left and your cost is higher whereas let's may i step here sorry but it's okay so let's say your company is here operating at this point it's very bad because at this cost you can go at the higher service level correct or if you're here at the same service level you can go at this cost you should not paying this much correct so the first attempt for a company is to go to this frontier line whichever line where you can get the maximum profit are you with me so, so far so that's the first quest for us to go into frontier line but you will become just like anybody else like any other company if you're on the frontier line you have to be better than that all right so how can you be better let's say you already somewhere here anywhere in this line where you get the maximum profit you're already here so does other company so how can you make it better any idea exactly make a new line right if this is a surface level zero where let's say this is your cost zero co your point at a that gives you a surface level of s zero right this is your original point where also other companies also having that point now when you move the curve to the right like this one you have a choices either you bring your cost down maintaining the service level at s0 but you can have a lower cost at c1 or you're happy with the cost but you will improve the service level with the same cost correct that's very theoretical but that's really true i give an example let's say if you have your first job as warehouse manager you want to improve service delivery of your product don't ask your boss give me more forklift give me more truck because you only play on the left this group should be able to cross the frontier line how can you improve delivery without adding forklift right if your respond to your boss is only oh, okay boss give me more forklift or you know marketing increase market share or give me more marketing budget so now this is where we bring in into asia business environment where i can answer your your doubt whether operation management can operation can influence the tax global network in today's world like pak made already said products and service go across boundaries between countries right oranges he gave an example of oranges now i give an example this is standard and poor one third 
of Standard and Poor's top 500 companies in the US, publicly listed company, one third of them, of sorry, one third of 500, 500 top companies in the US, they get the earnings from overseas, right? But then, if you look here, the, the solid line here in the black, if you're a US company, this is your statutory tax rate. If you have to make a profit, if you make a profit, you have to pay 39% of income tax. But they're paying less than that. They're paying less than that. This is US company. And US tax authorities, uh, uh, IRS, right, are very strong. They will chase you wherever. And the US has a tax ruling that if you're a US company or US citizens, you are a subject for a tax for your international income. Wherever you live, wherever you work and earn, you have to pay US tax. That's a US law. But nonetheless, this company were able not to pay or able to pay less than US tax rate. How come? How come they can get away? Sorry? They incorporate their companies outside of the US maybe? Sorry? They incorporate their company or has headquarters in other uh, nations? But then if you're a US company, they will chase you. Even though you have a... Uh, how does it work? Yeah, they, they might have another office outside US. But if they're publicly listed in US, the full consolidated p and subject to US tax. And this is perfectly legal, by the way. Not easy, but perfectly legal. And I can s explain to you the trick if you're managing the global network. Sorry? Maybe they use part of their income to, uh, on charity so they can avoid some taxes. They use their income for? Charity. For charity could be, but that's, that's not many, right? <laughs> Normally only 2% of your income, then you give a charity. And that's a year, that's the ded deductible. But this is from net profit. It's only like 10% gap. That's a big, right? Yes? Um, they have subsidiaries that are listed as um, other countries' companies outside of the US. That's what I heard. Can. They can. The only problem is that, again, if you're subsidiaries of US company, this parent's company is also subject for the subsidiaries' income in the US tax law. So it doesn't matter, right? For example, you make a profit in Holland or in France, in German, US will see, okay, you have made a profit over there, this is a tax for your operation in Netherlands or in Germany from your subsidiaries. Yes? Because they don't uh, report your profit. That's illegal. Hmm? You don't report your profit, that's illegal. Go ahead, please. Don't report your profit like how long? Yeah, I, I'm not going to, to share about that one because I don't know, right? Uh, like I said, this is perfectly legal, but it's not easy. It's perfectly legal, it's not easy. I'm not talking about drugs money, right? Or money laundering. It's not. It's a perfectly legal. That's why I said before, it's a optimizing your network. It's perfectly legal, not easy. Last attempt of trying to explain how come this company able to pay much lesser tax rate even though they are in the U.S. company, in the U.S. Juri tax jurisdiction. No? Last attempt. And my next slide is my last slide, by the way. That's it. After that, whether you understand or not, I don't care. Sorry. <laughs> Transfer pricing. Tell me how, how it works. Oh, it's very so, close. So <laughs> very close. They try to um, make some sales between the intercompany, right. and then they uh, set the profit between the sales of the company near to 0%, therefore they didn't need to pay any tax okay. between the company. Uh, very close, but it's, it's also close to illegal, right? <laughs> Transfer pricing has a limit. But let me just explain you with this one, right? This is also Asian business environment. You see, in Asia, in Asia, right? In average, Japanese, I think, is the highest. In China, in Thailand, in China, uh, sorry, I mentioned in China already, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, the income tax rate for company is about what? Income tax rate. What is the rate? If you make a profit of 100, how much do you have to pay tax? How many percent? Hmm? About 35%, right? 
about 35 percent. It's about the same, right? Uh, in Germ in in Holland, personal income tax is very high, up to 52 percent, right? But they have a very good uh, uh, anyway uh, social system. But nonetheless, 35 percent average in the countries in Asia, with exception of two countries. Can you name two countries? And what are the exceptions? Two countries in Asia that have a very different tax rate. Oh, by the way, these countries also they talk amongst each other. They have a bilateral agreement discussion to prevent the transfer pricing practices. Two countries. Can you mention? Huh? Singapore, how much is the tax rate for income, corporate income tax? From 5 to 17 percent depends on your activities. 5 to 17 is already half than the average. The other country, or used to be a country now and not a country anymore, is Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong has a very low uh, tax rate as well. That's why you see a lot of big corporations have, have a regional office in Hong Kong and Singapore. It doesn't make sense because that's very expensive to run an office there, right? The space, cost of living, manpower, everything is so expensive in both, in both places, Hong Kong and Singapore. But they're still investing and building uh, offices over there. And then how does it work? How does it work? You mentioned very close transfer pricing. Let me just give an example like this one. You don't see it in the slide because it's quite sensitive. So you can take a picture with me. It's not, it's not a slide. Uh, it's just a hypothetical example. Let's say you have a factory in Vietnam. Right? You produce whatever in Vietnam and you, your market is in Indonesia. I'll give an example also here. You make this in Vietnam, the cost of making this product, either you produce in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, is the same. Let's say $10. That's the input cost, $10 to make this product. And you can sell it in China or in Indonesia or whatever at $20. Right? Just to give an example, $20 including logistic costs. Because logistic costs, although Pak Made said it's quite expensive, the difference, but in terms of percentage of cost of goods is very cheap. Right? Especially when you are selling expensive product. Right? So let's say you can sell this product to the marketplace, whatever, in Indonesia, or Malaysia, Thailand, at $20. How much margin you make in the system? Your factories in Vietnam needs a cost of 10 and you sell it elsewhere at 20. How much profit you make? It's a simple math, right? It's 10. It's $10, right? That's a system profit. And both of them are your companies. Now, when you operate in Vietnam, your cost is $10. In the practical real term, you have to sell it to your company in country B. In Indonesia, you have to sell it. You can sell it at any price between 10 to 20 because you have to make profit in Vietnam and you also have to make a profit in Indonesia. Otherwise, the tax authorities in that country will angry to you. Let's say you're in Vietnam, your, your subsidies in Vietnam, your cost is 10 and okay, I make a profit of five in Vietnam. I sell it, this product to my friend, my brother in Indonesia, $15. So I book $5 profit here and I pay 35% of $5 in Vietnam, right? Now I'm in Indonesia, I buy this product for my brother's company in Vietnam, $15, right? And I sell it $20 to my end consumer. I make another five prof five dollars profit and I pay $5, 35% of $5. So in total system, it's the same. I pay 35% of $10. Are you still with me? Right? So no matter how much you want to sell between these two companies, $15, $14, $12, it doesn't matter. You still have to pay total system, profit $10 times tax rate of 35%. So you have to pay $3.5. Correct? Are you still with me now? That is a standard way of doing things. Now, imagine you have, you establish a company in Singapore. Right? You have a company C here in Singapore. What the company C is doing, buy product from Vietnam, 
right? You also company this ABC company or your companies the same, right? You buy this product, and Vietnam still have to make a profit. Otherwise, the government will kill them, right? will chase them. So they have to make profit. Let's say you only make profit of one. My cost is ten. I'm selling this one to my brother company in Singapore at eleven dollars. So I make one profit times thirty-five percent rate. That's the tax that I'm paying in Vietnam. Now in Singapore, I bought this one eleven dollars from Vietnam, right? I'm selling this one transfer pricing nineteen dollars to Indonesia. Indonesia buys this one nineteen dollars, sell it twenty dollars because that's what the consumer wants to pay twenty dollars. I make one dollars profit times thirty-five percent. In Vietnam, how much profit do I make? Eight dollars. I buy eleven. I sell nineteen. So the total system profit still the same, ten dollars. Remember, the total. System. But in in Singapore, I make eight dollars profit, and I will pay seventeen percent of eight dollars. You do the math; it's cheaper. The total tax you have to pay. Is it correct? I, I don't have a flip chart, but I know your visualization is very strong, right? You can imagine. Do I lose anybody here with this simple math? You still with me, right? So that Singapore office is a tax principles company that optimizing the network, leveraging the tax differential. Now the question is that why country like Vietnam, Indonesia do not angry with Singapore? Why are you putting seventeen dollars, seventeen percent tax rate, whereas the others is thirty five, right? And then Singapore said that this is my own country. I have a total freedom to set my tax rate. Unfortunately, now the other control is that when all these three companies, right, in Vietnam, Singapore, and Indonesia, belongs to U.S. company, the moment I repatriate my profit, my earnings in overseas, to outside, to back to the U.S., all the differential will be taxable to the U.S. So you will never repatriate your earnings. So this company, when they have one third of the revenues coming from outside Indonesia, they will never repatriate the earnings, even one single dollar. Because even when you repatriate one dollar, the whole entire profit is taxable. So you don't repatriate your earnings. So how you want to use this money? Because you're you're really parents' company in the U.S., for example, right? This earnings from international operation will remain at the international. For example, when you want to build a factory in Myanmar, you use that money. You don't get money from New York. You use that money from Singapore or Hong Kong. So they they use this fund to manage to expand to grow the business internationally. They never repatriate. Second question is that this Singaporean tax principles entities they have to substantiate the operation. They have to subsidize operation, right? They cannot just do a trading. They cannot just do buy and selling and never touch the product. Doesn't do anything with the product. They have to substantiate their presence, and that's depend on the countries, Vietnam and Thailand, Vietnam and Indonesia. How much substantiation you have to put? For example, substantiation means that yes, the one who designed the product is Singapore. The one who Release the product, good or bad, quality release is in Sing Singapore lab. The one who negotiate with the suppliers of this plastic is Singapore people, right? So Vietnam is just buying from the suppliers, where the supply selection is based on Singapore decision. So that's why you see also these big companies; they're not just making a paper company. Sometimes they make a paper company or not, which is illegal. So they really have a big operation in Singapore or Hong Kong. Big people, a group of people, and that's to create a substantiation. Are you with me so far? So that's when you see every front of the PNL I mentioned earlier. You can influence through operation management, except dividend yield. How you share dividend? Are we good so far? I think I lost you. Let's see the body language, right? And that's it. This is a summary. It's just get three things done, and you bring your company 
beyond, or we call it com bringing a competitive advantage to a company, and you maximize it this international business environment, not just local. But of course, you, before you go international, you really have to make your local operation really at the frontier line, even beyond the frontier line. All right, with that, I will leave it to you. Back to Mbak. Thank you, Mr. Risky. So before I start the conclusion, is there any questions about the presentation? Uh, uh, good evening, I'm Karisma from Universe Gajah Mada. Uh, I want to ask, what if you don't have other companies here and there? Is there any other solution? Yeah, because like I said in the, in the title before, it's an optimizing global network. So if you only operate in Indonesia, you cannot. Because Surabaya, Semarang, wherever you build a factories, falls under the same tax jurisdiction, right? The problem that many companies did, which is super wrong, that's why they came into trouble, is they create paper company in Panama. And they send their profit over there. And assuming here in Indonesia, we don't have enough profit, because your sales is 100, your, your cost is 50, but you only make profit of one. The other 49, you park it outside. That's illegal. So sorry, the answer is that to improve that one, that's why build factory in Myanmar, in Thailand, there are many companies doing that one. Charon Pokpan, for example, is a Thai company. They have a lot of factories in Indonesia. Good morning, my name is Amadea from Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, my question is actually kind of personal. Since I see you, your background is from mechanical engineering. How does your background in mechanical engineering help you in your current job right now? Thank you. You really want to know the answer, right? It's quite complicated, right? You see before, I'm not going to talk much about myself, but I, I had an engineering background, but I have three master degrees, right? So when I was an engineer, my first job is a lecturer. So I'm a university lecturer, junior lecturer, uh, in University of Indonesia, teaching engineering. My first 10 years job, now you can judge my age, right? My first 10 years of work is in engineering. I work, in, I work in Japan, everything, as engineering, right? I build factories, close factories, move factories. And I just realized I didn't make enough money being an engineer. And I thought at that time, MBA is really a ticket for success to climb and company leaders. An MBA, manage a business administration, right? And master of business administration, not master of bluffing arts. <laughs> because sometimes they just bluff, right? <laughs> because, so I took MBA just to improve my life, which I thought, I need to manage the business to be able to, to go further. And I was wrong. Before you manage a business, you have to manage what? The people. You manage the people. Business is just business. The company is just a signboard. There's nothing there. You cannot bring a company into jail. You bring people into jail. So you manage people. So I took my second master degree in organization behavior. And I found it was also wrong. It's not managing people. Can you guess who you should manage first before you manage business, before you manage people? You manage yourself. So I took myself philosophy. <laughs> like uh, Michael Jackson said, king of pop, right? If you want to change the world, start with the man in the mirror. That's what he said, right? So that's why I learned how to manage myself. And I'm st not st learning, like mentioned before, I'm still also studying same with you in Faculty of Economy and Business. That's, that's the journey. But I'm just curious, um, so with the release of Panama Paper case to the public, um, does it, ha have you ever heard that whether it affected um, any company's practices around tax, uh, tax evasion? Um, or do they just operate like it's the norm? Yeah, that's, that's really uh, a big subject during this stage. Uh, you probably heard also Luxembourg in Europe. There are several countries that have a very tax heaven countries, right? Luxembourg is one of them. Do you know Luxembourg? It's a country. It's a city of countries. In Netherlands, uh, if you drive by car, by the way, the road is very nice. Three hours in any direction, you already reach a border of countries. Right? In Luxembourg, it's probably 10 minutes, right? <laughs> 10 minutes in every direction, you're already outside Luxembourg. Luxembourg is also a tax haven. 
you heard about amazon.com you heard about starbucks right they have also ireland ireland also have a low tax rate and they are making up uh, optimizing that the globe the network in that tax heaven countries and because of the rules is clear but the interpretation is not the rules is clear but interpretation is not so people debating about the interpretation and now they are under scrutiny of their parents company like us mostly that they are subject for a tax that they haven't paid same in europe as well the europe union they also have a union and said that you are not operating fairly so you have to pay a penalty i give an example this is public domain information for example who is the lowest tax rate in the company that operates globally which company that you think paid the lowest tax rate you see this one snp the average about 29% right tax rate who is the company that has a lowest tax rate in the in the world that operates globally and they perfectly paid perfect uh, follow the, the 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 rules yahoo by 2% next after that it is Pfizer pharmaceutical by 4% but from time to time they also hit the rocks stumbling the, the rocks and Pfizer for example they get i forgot the name so you can search it well they had to pay a penalty fines in the US i think big money billion of billion dollars now the difference is that with your question is that let me just give an example from the US because every country has a different opinion about transfer pricing US has they call it sub part f manufacturing tax ruling subpart f right in this subpart f a company like in singapore before has to substantiate nine elements to be able to do this transfer pricing including quality control pricing decision supply selection product design that's all nine right but you don't have to comply all nine you might put a heavier that let's say that in singapore i build a super expensive sophisticated lab to test the product you get a score point how much is a score point only the tax authorities will, will give you a score so you don't have to fulfill the nine sometimes you fulfill four or five but to heavy load it you overkill it right because fulfilling pulling the nine requirements you have to build a factories in singapore that's why also many companies build a factory in singapore which is super expensive like like for example nestle wyatt a friends of danone they built mid johnson they built hundreds of million euro factories in singapore and there is no cow and they're building a, a milk factories because of that so that's why the subpart f under under us law is subject for debate so that's why it's it's i would not call it as a gray area it's a subject for debate from time to time so panama papers also the same you sometimes you hardly see anyone sent to the jail because of panama but it's already like ethical questioning why you are parking your profit over there you are avoiding paying tax here which is a reality so it become an ethical question because it's hard to prove legally sometimes sometimes a country can prove it uh, i'm jing wen from uh, mahidong university in thailand uh, my question is how the free trade agreement affect the, your company uh, in terms of decision making of investment in this region yeah yeah free trade agreement is yes. different than tax As agreement right free trade agreement is different than tax agreement free trade agreement for example within asean there's a free trade agreement within asean countries free trade agreements is not controlling the tax it's controlling the duty you understand the difference right the duty is when you import product you pay duty if you have a free trade agreement the duty is much lower for example in asian almost every product is a zero duty you don't have a duty right uh, free trade agreement also happen between the region and a country like for example asian and china like pak made said that asian plus 1 asian plus 2 plus 3 asian and japan so between asian country and japan in europe for example uh, within europe there is no duty zero duty so that's a free trade agreement now how does it impact to us is really on product sourcing let's say when you buy something like this one the choice is you buy from india for example or you buy from thailand this is indonesia right if you buy this one from thailand the plastic cap for example you pay zero duty but if you pay from india you pay 10% duty then it's become your constructor your choice 
So that's a free trade agreement. That's a free trade agreement impacting sourcing decision. How you source your product. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Jihan from Universitas Gajah Mada. I'm just wondering, uh, you say that we have to optimize the global network, especially with the taxes and stuff. I'm just wondering, does it increase the risk of the compliance since the law of each country may be different? And if that's so, how do we manage to make sure that the, we still comply with each of the country's law? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, compliance is a must. It's not something that you compromise, right? So. It, yes, you're correct that if you operate in more multiple countries, it increases complexity of meeting regulatory requirements. Because you, meet to, you have to meet both countries' regula regulation. When you make this product in Vietnam, you have to meet the Vietnamese regulation on how to make this product. And when you sell it in Indonesia, you have to meet Indonesian regulation on how you sell this product. I give an example, the, uh, the last precious scandal about Korean instant noodle, right? That contains pork, right? In Korea, this product is perfectly fine. You can make any, I mean, this is legal, legitimate product, right? But when you sell it in Indonesia, you are subject for BPOM, Indonesian FDA, regulation on how you label the product. If you contain pork, you have to label it with contains pork. You can sell pork, but it has to label with contains pork. And that's what it means. So this product, although despite of compliance, fully compliance in Korea, to produce instant noodle, but it's not, it does not comply with Indonesian regulation where we sell the product or they sell the product. So you're right, uh, operating more internationally, it gives more complexity in regulation. But don't forget, uh, don't worry, because in most countries, we have global organization that trying to standardize the standard across countries. For food product, for example, there is a WHO, there is a codex, Right? The controlling or governs, what is the minimum requirements for a food safety? While waiting for question, I'll give an example in Thailand, right? Thailand, there's a lot of food product coming out from Thailand. And I was amazed, if you're in Thailand, even you buy rice, not, not steam rice, or raw rice, it has halal logo. In Thailand. In Indonesia, not so many, right? They thought halal, uh, rice should be halal anyway. But in Thailand, if you buy a packed food, packed rice, Magnusson, there is no Magnusson. Whatever brand, there's a halal logo, right? If you buy even water like this, bottled water in Thailand, there's a halal logo. That's so easy to find packed food in Thailand with halal logo. And I asked my friend, because in like, Muslim in Thailand is, is, is minorities, right? It's minorities. Because Thailand wants to become a kitchen of the world. They said they want to become a kitchen of the world. They want to export food product outside. And the biggest market is Malaysia, Indonesia, and many Muslim countries. So for them, is, of course, complying with those market, targeted market product is good for their strategy. So they make the product halal, even though they're sold in local, in Thailand. They make an instant noodle, rice, water, halal. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Maharani Chandra Dewi. I'm from Gajah Mada University. Uh, I'm curious about the human resources that you mentioned before about managing human. Uh, so when the company has a branch branch in outside uh, in other country, they, their coworker must be have a different quality and habit. So how to manage the human resources so they can maximize uh, the profit same as the other of the branches. Thank you. Thank you, Mbak Maharani. I had a, I had a, I'm lucky that I'm, I have a, I've working in different places before. I led Thai people for five years, right? I led, uh, when I was in Europe, I had about almost like 300 people from 20 different nationalities. I have uh, two secretaries, one from Netherlands, one from France, oh, sorry, one from Italy. So uh, I had that luxuries, uh, but it doesn't matter. And my point is that, to your point, is that hum people always ask me the same thing, right? You risky, you work in different countries, right? Uh, how can you adjust? How can you adapt right, yourself working with other countries? And to me, the answer is not, you never adjust, you never adapt. Because you become someone else if you try to adapt. And you always compare. Oh, in Indonesia, this is how I did. Now I'm in Thailand, this is what I did. No, you never. You, you don't adapt, you don't adjust, because you continue to compare. And people don't like to be compared. If you're in Vietnam, 
Don't compare Vietnamese with Myanmar or Malaysia. They don't like it. They will hate you, right? Now, what I did is to accept that there are differences. And people, they are, instead of looking at the differences, look at the commonalities. In my experience, there are two universal values that every nationality will do the same. Two values. It's not too many. Can you guess what is the two universal values? When you work in any different countries, you want to move people up, right? You want to mobilize people. There are two universal values that wherever you work with or you work at, it will work. It's two. Regardless, you work with Japanese, uh, Sumatra, if you are in the local context, right? People said, always said that. I also managed the people from Jogja. They said, oh, Rizky, in Jogja, you have to do like this. What they said is still fall in these two values. Can you guess, Mbak Maharani? Respect, very good. People want to be respected, right? And? Very good. And treated them fairly, with all the fairness, right? I give an example. In Thailand, the difference is that how you respect people. The difference is how you respect people, not about whether this group will be respected, need respect, or this is not need the respect. Everybody needs to be respected. In Thailand, the difference is how you respect. In Thailand, you respect people by why. You don't touch body part. You don't shake hand. You do why. This is why. Is it why, right? You do why. This is your respect. You don't touch body part. In Netherlands, you kiss three times. Right? Three times. And start with the right, right? It's right or left? It doesn't matter. It's three, three times. In Saudi, it's two times. In Arabic, right? Uh, of course, man to man, woman to man, right? Woman to woman. So it's the same. In Japanese, you bow, right? And the difference with bow is Indonesian bow like this. You try to see the face. Japanese, they don't see the face. You bow like this, right? And if you're more junior, you have to give respect. You bow the last. You bow the first and you bow the last. So that's why you see people bow many times. <laughs> so respect and fairness. And then I, I give an example, right? In Europe, it, it different. In China, I, I work in China also, in, in Indonesia, in Asia. When you lead people, you give them instruction. You just give them instruction, right? You just give them instruction. Do this. Go there. Hit them or whatever. And they will do it. Because power distance is very important. They see you with your power. How many stripes you have here? In Europe, they don't care about power distance. You move people with what? You let them do. One answer, one question that you have to really have a good right answer. Why? They always want to know why. Why do I have to do this? And you should always have a good right answer for that. And they will kill you if you drop names. Why do I have to do this? Oh, because the CEO said so. And they will kill you. I don't care about the CEO. <laughs> right? I give an example. When I was leading European operation, we had to do something really difficult at the time. Helping India business. Which is small, tiny business and losing money anyway. And my people said, why do you have to do help India? It's a small business. We can help other markets that really make a big business and we are making profitable. And if I said, why? Because India, because CEO said so, they will kill me. What I said to them is that, look, if you don't help India, 150 people of our fellow colleague will lose their job. And that's, they will move them. Willingness to help the other 150 people of fellow employees in India. So, Respect and fairness, that's a universal values. Don't try to see the difference because they are not the same. In Netherlands, they eat a lot of bread and cheese, right? A lot. And you know the difference in Holland between lunch and dinner for Dutch people? You know the difference, lunch and dinner in, in, in Holland? They eat, you eat a lot of bread and cheese, right? Brocha and cast and malloc. <laughs> they drink milk lunch time, it's strange, right? But anyway, it's very healthy. The difference between lunch and dinner in Netherlands for Dutch people. Can you guess? Friends will laugh about this one. Can you guess the difference lunch and dinner for Dutch people? Six hours. 
That's the difference. You don't laugh. You don't understand. <laughs> it's the same food. It's just six hours different. <laughs> okay, my name is Kevin. I'm from Atma Jaya, Yogyakarta. Um, from your slide before, which is the improving surface, surface while managing cost. You said that, uh, no, not you said, but usually if we want to increase the, the level of our surface, we have to increase, yeah, increase our cost. But in this slide, you, you show us that we can make a new line when we are stuck on our point where we can reach the maximum profit or revenue with the current cost and the same with the other companies. So can you just give us some example or maybe some or your point of view how to increase the service level while managing or lower the cost? I, I give an example, right? Uh, stealing your asset, stealing your capacity from existing asset. I use the bad word just to punch the, the point. When you're given a factories, let's say you're given a factories, you're a factory manager, right? You're given a factories that the machine, everything, the machine supplier said that you can produce 100 bottles per hour. And these suppliers also sold the same equipment to co your competitors, right? Some companies can only produce 90 because a lot of inefficiencies. So that means they are on this frontier line, which is very bad, right? You spend money to buy machine that should be capable of producing 100, but you only run it for 90, that's bad. But some company run it at 100, that's the best. And that's that's a good, right? But that the question is that can you make it 110 with the same asset? Right? It's It looks almost impossible, but it could. i give an example. Uh, again, now I'll go details. Unfortunately, there is no engineering here. But in engineering, right, they call it a loss tree. When you run a machine, the machine needs to stop for a certain reason, like maintenance. Change over. You change from this pack to that pack. You have to take a change. Over. Japanese are very expert in this one. They call it lean project or a lean six sigma gimba kaizen, whatever they call it. Right, is to reduce the losses. So when the machine supply said that it's hundred, they already come with assumption that you need a certain time to shut the line down. Can you reduce that one? There's a lot of techniques, pokayok, everything in engineering, they, they learn how to make a change over faster. I'll give an example, uh, Ferrari, Formula One race. Formula One race. If there is no pit stop, right, almost everyone reaches the same time at the point. Many, many of the game changers who win or who lose, who will go to the podium or not, it's only efficiencies during pit stop. So that's why they race technology skill on how to reduce time during pit stop, you know, change tire. So that's how you do uh, crossing the frontier line because everybody needs uh, to change a tire, right? Refuel. Can you do faster than the other? The engine is control. You cannot go engine faster for Formula One, you know, uh, regulation. That's the answer. Part. Where you lose, uh, they call it loss three, you attack that loss three. Okay, I'm Lydia from Atma Jaya, Yogyakarta. Also, uh, I want to ask you about the global network optimization. Uh, you said that uh, company choose Singapore and, or Hong Kong to reduce their tax. And I want to ask you, uh, uh, transporting uh, their goods to among countries will give the export and import tax. Uh, it will uh, increase their cost and also the cost of trans transportation. Uh, decreasing the tax of their income uh, will give another increasing of cost to them. How about it? And also I want to ask your opinion. If you are an owner of a company, will you choose a country with a low labor cost or the country with the low tax rate? Thank you. It's a good question, Lydia. Uh, there are two, two things, right? When I give an example, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Singapore. The product never land in Singapore. Even the transactional is through Singapore office. The Singapore people or office never touch the products. The products ship directly from Vietnam to Indonesia. What they are doing is that back-to-back -back order. So they are selling here. You, you know, in, in shipping, you can say that who is the buyer and where to deliver. The buyer is me in Singapore. I want you to deliver to straight to Tanjung Priok, to Jakarta, or to Semarang, to Indonesia. 
right? So it's back to back. When the product loaded in the containers, the invoice issued from Vietnam company to Singapore company, see risky, this is your product, I already sent, sell it, right? And then throughout the process, I immediately issued the PO to Indonesian. Indonesia, my product is going, your product that you're going to buy is on the boat now. <coughs> this is the invoice and the product goes straight. So never go via Singapore. So that's why when you ask about it will increase logistic cost, the answer is no. Because it goes straight anyway, right? So that's one of the question. The, the, the second question is about whether we choose where we have a lower uh, labor cost or more efficient tax. Unfortunately, that question was 20, 30 years ago. When the countries, it's obsolete question, by the way. Countries at the time competing by cheap labor, correct? I'm a cheap labor, I'm a cheap labor. So people move factories, like you know, many Japanese electronic company from one of countries that becoming more expensive to a cheaper place to produce a product. But nowadays, unfortunately, no, because they also increase the minimum wages. And if you look at the cost component, that labor cost is still very marginal compared to the total cost. Let's say to make this one is $10, the cost of labor is only 0.5% or 2%. So even though you double the cost of labor, it doesn't impact this one. But the tax is very big. The tax different. I, that's why also now many companies, like I mentioned before, big giants companies like our industries, build a factory in Singapore to produce milk where they don't have any single cow. Or maybe they have a cow in, in the zoo. So it's depending on cost structures, but I can tell you, unfortunately, labor cost is, input cost is very little nowadays. I think that's it. I, I get the sign that we are running out of time. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Reski. So I'm going to try to create conclusions of our discussion for today. The first one is we have to um, acknowledge two things that is important. The first is to respect and uh, value other cultures uh, in order for you to succeed in um, all the markets in the world. And I think um, one of the messages that I got from uh, getting my master's degree in the US was you tend to forget how to network and um, you know try to acknowledge other cultures in order for you to survive in the businesses, um, in the real uh, world cases. And the conclusion about the presentation is the first one to get the fundamentals right, which is, okay, one minute, uh, which is about the uh, ROI and the cash flow of the company. The second one is the crossover, the trade-off frontier, which is regarding the cost and surface level. And the third one is optimize your network, which is, that's all the discussions is about. And I want you to know the importance of uh, network uh, in with your friends, don't sit with a group of friends that came from same nationality to try to know other people. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.